All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the Israel Wake Up Call. My name is Mike Malice. I want to jump right into this one. This is part two of the Botham Jean Amber Geiger issue. Now, in part one, we primarily discuss the little brother, and his name is Brand Jean. I know what it is now. We discussed him suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. Now, in this episode, we are going to talk about the biggest case of Stockholm Syndrome that I've ever seen. And it comes from the presiding judge over this case, and her name is Tammy Tammy Kemp. If you're not familiar with what she did, after the jury deliberated the verdict, she got off of her bench, went down to the defendant, this Edomite woman who blatantly, in cold blood, shot and killed Botham Jean in his own apartment, an innocent Israelite man, and hugged and embraced this, and not only that, but gave this Edomite woman a Bible. Now, I'm going to show you, as this episode goes through, why that was so wrong and so disrespectful. Now, I'm going to tell you this. If you are not going to watch this all the way through, do yourself a favor and turn it off now because I'm going to be digging into the scriptures today. So yes, this is one of those episodes. So if you don't have the patience and you don't have the diligence and you don't have the respect for the word of the Most High God, go away now. Don't bother watching this any further. But for those of you that continue to watch this, and I mean watch it all the way through, all the way to the end, all the way to the logo screen, trust me, you will not be disappointed. All right? Now, I got something for you. First thing that we're going to do, we're going to play the video of Tammy Kemp as to why she said she gave her a hug. And then afterwards... I'm going to play a video of one of her peers. So they're gonna go back to back, all right? So first video, here we go. Dallas judge Tammy Kemp is defending her decision to hug police officer Amber Geiger after she was sentenced to 10 years in prison for the murder of Botham Jean. This was the moment Kemp offered Geiger the hug after Jean's brother had done the same thing. Now Kemp says Geiger twice asked for a hug and that she could not refuse. She spoke with our Dallas Fort Worth station, KTVT, and she said her faith guided her actions. She will forever be the murderer of Botham John. How she carries that thus forward depends on how we receive her. And as a Christian, I believe I'm commanded to offer her love and compassion. Do you think the judge that was sitting on the bench behavior towards Amber Geyer in the whole Dallas police shooting situation was appropriate uh, and how to, and then uh, give me the the legal side of what you think let's just say if you was on the Texas State Bar Association and give me the personal side and how you feel about that whole situation because you know it was an uproar right right that. oh absolutely mm -hmm. I think what she did was in, grossly inappropriate mm. Oh and, my God! Uh, wait a minute. Wait. I, okay. See, I'm not crazy. We. Uh, mm -mm. I'm not crazy, Brett. Mm -mm. I think everybody agrees that that was just unusual. But there, but there are a lot of levels to the things that she did wrong. First of all, she did not. Although I did not see the entire sentencing, you need to focus on why she's going to jail. Mm -hmm. right. She made a lot of mistakes. She she was you know the the decision to fire was made uh, recklessly. She didn't look around in her surroundings. She didn't pay attention. She already had some kind of racial animus. So she had all these things that she did wrong. That's what you focus on. You're going to prison for this, not I'm so sorry you made a mistake. That's number one. Number two, you can't, not only are judges not allowed to do improper things, you have to avoid the appearance of impropriety. Amen. Yes. And yes, if she's not in the habit of hugging murderers. Oh! then she shouldn't have hugged this one because the only reason she hugged her because she was a police officer. Uh -huh. That's number two. And that, that's what people come away with. And then what you do when you do that is you get divisive in the community because you upset people. You have to know how things, the optics look. Amen. Third problem that she had is she shouldn't have given her a Bible. What are you going to do with the atheist killers? 
You know what I mean? You can't proselytize from the bench. You you, you know, you 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 just can't do it. You know, your beliefs are your beliefs. Right. But the, the separation of search and state is a very serious thing. Mm. And you can't just, you know, I'm going to forgive you. God's going to forgive you. I'm going to give you a bite. Ah. Because my thing is. All right. So you saw that there for yourself. And I wanted to make sure that I gave you this from two different perspectives. First of all, let's do a comparison. These are two Israelite women. Both of these women are in the same profession. The both of these women hold the same position in their professions. But one suffers from Stockholm Syndrome and the other one doesn't. Did you hear what Judge Toller said? Judge Toller said this woman should not have done that at all. It was out of place. It was out of line. It was complete disrespect to not only the brother that's dead, but to his immediate family and to his people, which is the same as her people. That woman single-handedly turned her back on her entire nation. And why do I say that? I ask you this. The same way that I said about Brant Jean, the little brother. How many of our Israelite brothers and sisters, black, Latinos, and Native Americans. How many hugs did she pass out when she put sentences on them? How many young black men and how many young black women did she get up off the bench to go talk to and hug and embrace? Then furthermore, and this is the most disrespectful part and you're gonna, you're gonna learn why today, how many of our Israelite brothers and sisters did she give a Bible to? I don't know the answer, but I can certainly guess there's probably going to be none. I would love to talk to that woman to ask her. I really, really would. I would love for her to address that issue and provide some truth with it. Because guess what? There are cameras in the courtroom. This is the biggest disgrace of a person, of an Israelite that was put into power. And you're going to find out why. So, of course, like I said earlier, this is going to be a very scripture heavy episode. So I want you to open your Bibles. And again, I read from the 1611 King James Version Bible. Now, Israelites, I'm getting ready to tell you this, and I'm going to tell you this right now. You're going to hear some things today that you've never heard before. And I'm telling you, and this is recorded. I'm keeping this. This is recorded. I am not apologizing for anything that I say today. Do we have that understanding? So this goes to our Israelite brothers and sisters that's watching this. And this goes to the other nations that's also watching this. I am not apologetic for anything that I say today. And I want you to understand something. This is not racism. This is scripture. This is coming directly out of the scriptures. If you have a problem with that, talk to the Most High about it because these are his words, not mine. So I want to go ahead. I want to get this very first scripture. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. So as you see, the Bible says to prove all things. So everything that I talk about is going to come directly out of the scriptures. Now, with that being said, I want to go ahead and go to Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 1. And the reason why I'm going here, because the Bible talks to a specific people. Those people are the Israelites, God's chosen people. Now, just a little history before we get into this. And let me say this before I do that. If you are a first time person watching this show here, I do a lot of scriptural breakdown. I don't leave the Bible. I stick with the 1611 King James Version Bible and I break this down according to the scriptures. And I'll need everyone to understand that. Now, for those of you who are already in this truth, I need you to have some patience because 
there's our family, our other Israelite brothers and sisters. This is their first time watching. And guess what? They don't know what you know, but they're coming into the truth now. So it may sound like I repeat a lot of these scriptures. And the truth is, I really don't because the Bible says everything is very redundant. It says things over and over and over. But guess what? They have to learn who they are. All right. So I want you to remember that they're in a place where you used to be when you first started. All right. But let's get back to the point. Deuteronomy chapter one, verse one. Now, just to give a little background here, Moses just delivered the children of Israel out of slavery when we were serving slavery in Egypt. Those people are our ancestors. All right. So Moses has the attention of the Israelites. That is his audience. This is who the Most High God is speaking through Moses. He's talking to his chosen people, the Israelites. All right, so let's get it. Deuteronomy chapter one, verse one. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side Jordan in the wilderness. Now, I wanted to bring that out just so that you can see by the scripture who Moses is talking to. He's talking to the children of Israel and not the entire world. One specific people, one audience. Now, what is so special about these people? Now, what else does the Most High God say about these particular people? So now we're going to go ahead and we're going to jump to Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. Now that was heavy. We're going to talk about that for a little bit. What did the Most High God say about the Israelites? First of all, he said that we are a holy people, a separate people. And not only are we a separate people and a holy people, but we are a special people unto himself. And not only are we a holy people, not only are we a special people, but we are above all nations on the earth. So I'm going to ask you a question. So now when you have America and when you have these other nations that come talking about equality, does the Bible talk about equality? Was that equality in that scripture right there? The answer is no. Because 
If you are above something, how can you be equal? The Most High did not say we were here. He said we were here. Now, because we are here and because he chose us to be his holy people, because he made us special people, he gave us something to do. He said we had to keep his commandments. Not just back then, but for a thousand generations. That means we were to keep them all the way back then, and we are to keep them now. The same laws that were given to them back then, we ought to be keeping right now. And guess what? That is the biggest debate. Oh, we don't have to keep the laws anymore. The Christian church would tell you, oh, we can't do them laws. The Most High God said, you're supposed to keep these laws. And now, what did, and this is the part, and I love this part. That's why I wanted to read that in its entirety. What did the Most High say about the people who were not going to keep these laws? He said he was going to repay you to your face. I don't know about you. I don't want none of that. I don't want the taste of that cup. So for all of you people out there, all of you Christian pastors, and all of you, you sufferers of Stockholm Syndrome who sit out there and say, we don't got to keep these law statutes and commandments, all of you rebellious Israelites, you got it coming. Because the Most High God said he's going to repay you to your face, and he is not going to slack. That means he's going to give you full of your punishment. I don't want none of that. No, thank you. All right. So now, with that being said, I want to continue. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all all nations of the earth. Again, do you see the Most High repeating himself? He said it again. I'm going to set you on high above all nations of the earth if you keep my commandments. And I want to keep going back to this. And you're probably, going to, you're probably asking, what does this have to do with this case? It has everything to do with this case. And like I said, stick around all the way to the end. But as you see the Most High, he said it again. So now, that is if we kept his commandments. So guess what? As a nation, our forefathers, even us today, we still do not keep the commandments of the Most High God. So there was a consequence that he told our ancestors all the way back then. What would happen if we don't keep the commandments? Now, let's go ahead and jump down to verse 15. But it shall come to pass... If thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. All right. So as you see, the Most High made that dividing line. Either you keep my commandments and I'll bless you or you disobey me and I'm going to curse you. There's no gray area there. Either you keep them or you don't. Now, we're going to continue on. We're going to jump down to verse 45. Now, before we go there, I want you to ingrain in your mind laws, statutes, and commandments, and who he gave them to. He gave them to Israel. He didn't give them to the other nations. He's talking to Israel. He gave his laws, statutes, and commandments to Israel, this particular people, all right? So now, verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder 
and upon thy seed forever. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore shall thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor shew favor to the young. Now that was a lot to take in, wasn't it? Because the Most High God broke that down. He said, number one, if you don't keep my Lord's statutes and commandments, I'm going to send you to these nations where you're not going to understand their language. I'm going to send you people from afar that is going to take you and you're going to serve them. And these people are going to be your enemies. And not only are they your enemies, but they're also the enemies of the Most High God. So as you see right here, the Most High is laying down a foundation. He's giving you a choice. Keep my commandments or don't. And it's consequence if you don't. But of course, I want you to focus on that. Those laws, statutes, and commandments and who he gave those to. All right, let's continue. Verse 64. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Now, do you see what the Most High God just said? He said that his Israelites were going to be scattered all over the earth. Not just Han America, but all over this planet. So for those of you that are not familiar with scripture and definitely not familiar with your history, the so-called blacks, we were not the only ones to go into slavery. Because our other Israelite brothers and sisters include the Hispanics and the Native Americans. Their conquests began with the conquest of Columbus back in 1492. That was the first round of the slavery that God promised our ancestors all the way back then. And then in 1619 is when the Southern Kingdom, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, when we went into our slavery. So for those of you who are saying that the Latinos and the Native Americans are not Israelites, you don't know your history and you don't know the scriptures. Point blank. Now, this also mentions something else. It said that it was going to send us into nations where we are going to worship other gods of wood and stone. The wood is the cross that represents Christianity, that evil, disgusting religion that was forced on our people. Not only blacks, but also the Latinos and also the Native Americans, because we all serve, or they taught us to serve, that white Jesus in Christianity. You know it's true. And not only that, but now the stone, talking about the cobblestone, which is Islam. The Most High God told us all the way back then, that is right here in the Bible. 
That's why I said, you can't mess with this Bible. They can try all day. They have tried to prove this Bible wrong on so many occasions. And guess what? They fail every time. Why? Because this book is a prophetic book. This book was written by the finger of the Most High God himself and inspired through his chosen Israelite people. You can never prove this book wrong. Never. All right. Now let's continue. Let's go now to verse 65. And among these nations shall thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. Now, it doesn't take a genius to figure that one out. A trembling heart? So, let me ask you brothers something. How do you get when the police pull up behind you? How do you feel, and this is for all of us, how do you feel when you know that they're going on a firing spree at your job and you see your boss's door open because you know that you're next. And sorrow of mind. All of our people getting killed in the street. Not only killed in the street, but killed by police officers in our own house. Sorrow of mind. You mean to tell me right now that Botham Jean's mother and his family don't have sorrow of mind right now because that brother was in his house eating ice cream and was killed by an Edomite cop and only given 10 years. Absolutely ridiculous. This Bible is so accurate and yet so many of us will go right ahead and deny it. Ridiculous. But now let's go home to verse 68. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen and no man shall by you. If you didn't understand that, then I don't know what's wrong with you. But the Most High said he is going to send us back into slavery, which was in Egypt, as we read earlier. Egypt means slavery. I'm going to send you to Egypt again with ships. What ships are those? The slave ships, the very same slave ships that came and got the Northern Kingdom, the Hispanics and the Latinos, excuse me, the Latinos and the Native Americans. The very same ones. The Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria and the other ships that came along with it as well. They had slaves on those ships. Then in 1619, they went and got us off the coast of Africa and also from the Arabs, the Ishmaelites, and brought us here to the Americas on ships, just like the Bible just said. And he said, when we got off those ships, we were going to be sold unto our enemies. There's that word again, enemies, enemies, enemies. And he said, for bondmen, which is a slave man, and bondwoman, which is a slave woman, and no man shall buy you. There will be no rich person or any person with the might in their hand or the money in their account that will come and buy you and say, you know what? I want to buy each and every last one of these slaves here and put us into freedom. It never happened. Why? Because the Most High God said it wouldn't happen because he sent them against us. He sent our enemies against us because we broke his laws, statutes, and commandments. That is our punishment. All right, so now, why does all of that matter? What's, what's going on with this here? Why is this so, why is it such a horrible thing? Because we are his chosen, special, holy people that's supposed to be up here, but we choose to stay down here. 
And this really pissed off the Most High. And he was so mad and so disgusted with us because he gave us everything. He said, the only thing that we have to do is keep his commandments, but we are rebellious. He said, we are a rebellious, stiff-necked people. With all the evidence right here in the book, we go against everything that he says. So the Most High said he was going to do something to us. And this is something right here. This is where your antennas better turn on right now. I want you to go now to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 4. And thou, even thyself, shall discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. Now let's go ahead and break that down. Why is that scripture so important? The Most High God said that he was going to discontinue the Israelites from their heritage. Why is that so important? Why is that such a big deal? Why will your Christian pastor, those Sunday devils, never teach you that scripture. But before we get that, let's continue on with the rest of the content in that scripture. He said, we were going to serve our enemies. There's those enemies again. Who are our enemies? Who are the ones who had us in slavery? Who are the ones we were sold to? Who are the ones we had to serve? You'll be afraid to say it, but I'm not white people, the Caucasians, not only here in America, but scattered all over the earth. We serve those people. We serve the Edomites. That is the biblical name for the Caucasian, Edomites. Descendants of Esau, the twin brother of Jacob, Israel. And like I said, you'd be afraid to talk about this. I won't be afraid to talk about it at all. Why? This is our history. But the Most High God said that we are going to kindle a fire in him, in his anger, in his wrath. So you ask yourself, why do we go through these things? Why in the world can a Dallas police Edomite officer walk into a brother's house, shoot this brother in cold blood, and only serve 10 years? Or how about the ones who shoot us down and kill us and get away with it? This is all a part of the curses. But let's get back to the discontinuing of the heritage. Why is this so important? Why did we kindle a fire that was in God that he said he was going to bring his wrath upon us? Let's find out. Genesis chapter 32 verse 28. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince has thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. Now, I'm not sure if you picked up on that. What are you? You're an Israelite. If you are a descendant of the transatlantic and sub-Saharan slave trade. What did the Most High say? He said, Israel means Prince. Now we're, to now, we're talking in a male and female vernacular. Israel means a prince or a princess, if you are the descendants of Jacob. That's a part of our heritage. We come from that line because we are the descendants of the slaves. So what did the Most High God say? You are Israel, princes, and princesses. But that's not the only one there. Let's go ahead and continue. Genesis chapter 35, verse 10. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name 
Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Israel, did you hear that? Did you hear what the Most High God said? Did you hear what he said when he said that kings shall come out of the loins? First of all, he's talking about Christ. But did you notice it was plural? Kings. And when you speak in the male vernacular there, they're talking about both, male and female. Kings, queens, princes, princesses. Out of this particular people, the 12 tribes of Israel, the sons of Jacob, those descendants, you Israelites, you blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans, that is talking about you. That's talking about us. So when the Most High God said that he is going to discontinue us from our heritage, he's saying, I'm going to make you forget that you are royalty walking this planet. I'm going to take those other nations. I'm going to put them above you because you won't listen. Because you won't follow my laws, statutes, and commandments. I'm going to make you forget who you are. I'm not even going to have anybody even notice what you are, which are kings, queens, princes, and princesses. That is who we are. And I am not ashamed. The Most High God said we are are not to be ashamed. His people will never be ashamed. And yes, I am telling you that, Israel, straight to your face. You are kings, queens, princes, and princesses. We are the children of God. We are his chosen people, and we are the royalty on this earth. According to the scriptures, that is why the Most High God said we fire, we, we kindle a fire in him because we are the greatest people on the planet and we continue to break his laws, statutes, and commandments. I don't care if you like it or not, too bad. That is who we said we are. And we have to get back to our heritage. But guess what? That's not it. Because that was Old Testament. So now let's go to the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should shew forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And as you see, Peter confirmed it. Why? Because Peter is an Israelite too. What did he say? We are a royal priesthood that is right here in the Bible. Who is the, who's the royal priesthood? The chosen people. The same people that God said in Deuteronomy 7, 6, we are his chosen people. We are the royal priesthood on this planet, you Israelites. That is who we are. We were discontinued from our heritage. We don't know who we are anymore, but guess what? You know now. Now you know. This is why it is so important that we keep the law, statutes, and commandments because the Most High God said we are the greatest people on the planet Earth. We are. We are. We are. Not Princess Diana. Not Prince Charles and all the other rest of that, that royal garbage. We are. And we've been told time and time again that we're nothing more than a bunch of dumb niggas, that we're nothing more than a bunch of slaves, that we ought to be lucky because they came to Africa and got us and brought us into civilized life. They gave us clothes. They gave us food. They taught us how to speak and all that garbage. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. The Bible says that we are the greatest people on the earth. We are the top tier. We are the top dogs. We are are the chosen people of God, and he only loves us, according to the scriptures. 
And you think they'll teach you that in your Christian church? Of course not. Those Christian churches, this is what I'm telling you here. Guess what? They are the biggest oppressors of our people. Why? Because they have all the information and they don't share it with us. Why? Because they can't and because they won't. Because if they do share this information with us, do you know what's going to happen to them? They're going to cut their funding and they're going to send them back out to the field. This is house niggas versus field niggas. That is what that mentality is. And these Christian pastors are nothing more than a bunch of house niggas. Do you understand me? They know the truth and they never told you. You go to church every Sunday and you've never heard those passages. They never told you who you were, who we were. And guess what? We fork out money to them every Sunday, every Sunday. And they are the biggest oppressors of our people. That's the truth. That was in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So Israel, guess what? You better face up to what you are. This is why it is so important and so adamant that we get back to keeping the commandments of the Most High. Because you are a special people. You are a holy people. You are a royal people. You can get mad all you want to. But for every person right now looking into that screen, every Israelite, let me tell you something. We are a beautiful people. But we have to stop killing each other. We have to stop hating on each other. We got to come back to our heritage. Our God-given heritage. It is our right. It is our birthright to know who we are. Why? Because the Most High God chose us. I didn't have anything to do with it. You didn't have anything to do with it. That is what the Most High God said. He said he chose us. And this is all here in the scriptures. So when a judge gets off of her bench and she goes down and she hugs an Edomite and embraces an Edomite woman that killed her own little brother, that is such a problem. Because that woman killed a king. And they, they don't care. This is why they have perverted our book time after time. This is why they went ahead and lied and said that Christ is a white man when the Bible clearly says that Christ is a black man. He was so dark that it looked like he burned in the furnace and he had woolly hair. This is why the Bible says that the angels are a burnished brass, the color of burnished brass. They're so dark that they look like burning coal. So, but what do they give you? They give you the image of these white angels with white wings, with long blonde hair and blue eyes. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. The Bible said Christ is black. The Bible says we, the Israelites are black. And the Bible also says that the angels are black. They change everything about our book. Why? To keep us from our heritage. And these Christian pastors, they murder our people every Sunday by continuing that same Christianity bullcrap indoctrination unto our people. This is the problem. But that's not it. Psalms chapter 96 verse 5. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So you see how the Most High God went ahead and made that separation again when he's talking about the nations because the nation of Israel, his chosen people, are one side. But the others here, he said that these other nations... Their gods are idols. What do idols mean? They mean false images, fake, phony, not the real deal. The Most High God said, I am the only God. I'm so powerful that I've made the heavens. And I am your God, 
Israel. So now I want us to go to the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. It doesn't get any more clear than that. When the Most High God says out of his own mouth, I am the Lord, your God, Israel. I am in the midst of Israel. I am your God and none else. You can't get any more plain than that. But yet you have all of these churches, especially those Sunday devils, these black pastors. They'll have all the other nations and everything come in and sit up right in the church and everybody congregates together when the Bible clearly says that he is the God of Israel and none else. God said he is in the midst of Israel. That's what the Bible says. And now you have, and let me address this here. So now for all of you people, you have... All of our prominent black figures, the Al Sharptons, the Jesse Jacksons, the Umar Johnsons, and the Roland Martins, you have all these conscious brothers, all these brothers with these shows, and you mean to tell me none of them will ever bring out this information? Do you know why? Because they are what you called agents. All of them. How is it that you have all of this? And, and that includes the Christian pastors. How do you have all this information in this book and you keep it from our people? They don't care about us. They never have and they never will. You know what they care about? They care about fame and they care about fortune. That is the only thing that matters to them. Your life doesn't matter to them at all. Why? If it did, they would tell you who you are. They don't bring us scripture. Don't you think this is something that we should know? They don't give us scripture. They give us philosophy. They give us their garbage, trash philosophy that they learn from these other nations when the Most High God said, stick to my laws, statutes, and commandments. That is what you, Israel, are to stick with, not the other nation philosophies or their vain deceit. And as a matter of fact, let's go ahead and get that. I want you to go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So out of the mouth of the most high God himself, he told us, Israel, do not follow behind these men of philosophy. Right there out the scriptures. Now, the question is, why? Why? Why is the most high God warning us so much about these men of our nation, our own people, and of the other nations? Because guess what? We learned who we were, who we were. Who are we? We are the royalty of the earth, the royal priesthood. But that is just who we are. But now we have to learn what we are. And I'm telling you right now, you've never known this. You've never, ever known this. You've never been taught this. But you're about to learn right now what you are. Psalms chapter 82, verse 6. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Israel, did you hear that? Did you hear what the Most High God called you? You kings, queens, 
princes and princesses, the Most High God said, we are gods. That is not my opinion that came right here out of the scriptures. That is what the Most High God said about you, Israel, the God that is in the midst of Israel. This is why the Most High God is so pissed off with us. This is why we kindle a fire. This is why the Most High God said in Deuteronomy 7, 6, that we are a holy people. We are a special chosen people unto himself. This is why he said we are going to be above all all nations. Why? Because we're not even the same people. Our matter isn't even the same. We are gods. That is why he is so upset with us because we are gods on this planet. The royal priesthood, the peculiar people, the peculiar people that will die like men. That is you. This is why it is so horrible every time we kill each other, every time we berate each other, every time we kick each other down. You're doing that to another God. I'm going to tell you this right now. The other nations, they already know that. They already know who we are. They have taken crafty counsel against the Israelites, just like the Bible said. Why? So that you will never know what you are. This is why they tell us all the time, we're nothing, we're nothing more than a bunch of dumb niggas, or we are a bunch of slaves, horrible, sick, disgusting people that do absolutely nothing but kill each other. We're dumb. We can't do anything for ourselves. We have to live off of their economy. We have to live off of their help. But guess what? That is a part of the curses because the Most High God put that on us. They had nothing to do with that. That is what God put on us. Why? Because we kept breaking his commandments. That's right out of the Bible, brothers and sisters, whether you like it or not. It is time that you accept who you are. These other races already know it. Now it's time for us to know who we are now. It's our time. Our time. The greatest, most protected secret on this planet is your identity. You heard it here. You read it here. You never learned that in church. So now that was the Old Testament. Let's now go to the New Testament. John chapter 10, verse 33. The Jews answered him saying, for a good work, we stone thee not, but for blasphemy and because that thou being a man makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. Out of the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. And that's why I wanted to go to verse 33. Who was Christ talking to? Who was his audience? His audience were the Jews, his own people, the Israelites. Because we are the real Jews. We're not Jew-ish. There's no such thing as ish. It's either you're a Jew, you're an Israelite, or you're not. That's who Christ is talking to. And he said, is it not written in your law that ye are gods? What law is he talking about? Remember, Christ referenced the laws, statutes, and commandments. He referenced everything that his father said because everything that his father says is law. It is the finality. So Christ is referencing Psalms where he said, have you not said that you are gods? And this scripture, it came out of the word. He said the scripture cannot be broken. Nothing is going to change what you are. Israel, nothing is going to change that. So look at that situation right there. You had these other gods that is getting ready to stone one of their own with rocks in their hand, about to kill each other. 
Does that happen today? You better believe it. Every time one of our brothers get ready to shoot each other, they pull out a gun or stab each other or get ready to murder them or beat them down, and that goes for our sisters too. The same thing was happening to Christ, and he walked the earth, and this is our king. This is the son of the most high God, and our people did it to him. You think they're not going to do it to you? This is why that judge can get off the bench and go down and hug her oppressor and give her our book. As a matter of fact, I want to deal with that. I want to deal with that situation right now as to why this is such a travesty that this judge went ahead and gave this Edomite woman, this wicked woman, our book. Here we go. Psalms chapter 50 verse 16. But unto the wicked, God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? So do you see who the Most High is talking to? This is important. This is why I was telling you, I want you to remember and ingrain it in your brain, the law, statutes and commandments and who it was given to. It was given to Israel. So who is God talking to in this particular passage? He's talking to the wicked. And we're going to deal with that in a second as to who the wicked are. But what does he say to the wicked? He says, what is it of you? to have, number one, my covenant. Now we learned earlier who the covenant belonged to. The covenant belonged to the Israelites, the fathers and the descendants of Israel, the 12 tribes. So the Most High God said, wait a second, to you wicked, number one, why are you holding my laws, statutes, and commandments in your hand? Why are these coming out of your mouth? And he said, even though you hold my book and you hold my covenants and my statutes and everything, he said, guess what? They don't belong to you, but you're going to go ahead and say them. You're going to let them come out of your mouth. And even though they're coming out of your mouth, you still don't keep them. You have no regard for it. You toss it to the side. That is exactly what the wicked does. Why? Because the wicked are the ones who gave us white Jesus. The wicked are the ones who told us that the angels were white and the people of the Bible are white. Every Christmas, every Sunday, you watch all of those Christmas movies and Easter movies that they plaster all over the place during this holiday time. And it's all these white people playing these parts. They painted Jesus white. Right now, there are paintings of white Jesus hanging in some of your houses and also hanging in the churches. And the scriptures say that you have to believe on Christ as the scriptures say. And the scripture says that Christ is a dark-skinned, he was so dark-skinned, it looked like he burned in a furnace and he had woolly hair. And guess what? Christ died a black man's death. He was hung from a tree. The Bible refers to it as a tree. Who else were hung from trees? We were. This is why during the raid, what I call it, during the, the time of the KKK or whatever, this is why they burned crosses on our lawns. Why? Because they knew who we belong to. Never thought about that, did you? But that's not it. There's more. Malachi chapter 1 verse 4. Whereas Edom, Edom, Edom saith, we are impoverished. But we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Israel, did you get that? Did you hear who the Most High was talking to? Who was his audience? Who is the border of wickedness? Edom, who today are the Caucasians. That is the biblical name of the Caucasians, 
Edom. That is the name that the Most High God gave their nation. And what did the Most High God say? He said he is going to have an indignation for them forever. What does forever mean? Nonstop. What does indignation mean? It means an anger or an annoyance for unfair treatment. The Most High God said he has an indignation for these people forever. Why? Because of the way they treat us. That's in the Bible. That's right here in the scriptures. And yet, this judge gets down, gives this Edomite woman our book. That is such a disgusting act. But guess what? There's more. Psalms chapter 137, verse 3. For there, they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. Israel, did you see that? Those who carried us away, who did this? Edom, the Edomites, the Caucasians, white people. I know you're scared to say it, but I'm not. What did they require from us? Mirth. And they said, sing us a song, entertain us. You belong to us now. Entertain us. They did it all the way back then and they do it today. With your singers, with your Cardi B's, with your Beyonce's, with your NFL, all the black players. Nigga, get on that field and run with that football. Nigga, get on that basketball court and go dribble that ball. For you Hispanics, hey, you know what? You wetbacks, get out on that baseball field and crack us some home runs. Get out in these soccer fields or football and go run around these fields and entertain us. But do you know what? Who are the most dominant ones at all of those professions? The Israelites. Why? because we are a special, holy, peculiar, special people. We're gods. So we're always going to outshine what they do. Now, this goes back to Jacob and Esau because Jacob and Esau, if you don't know, are twin brothers. Jacob, is the younger brother, Esau is the older. And the Bible says that the older shall serve the younger. And that the younger is going to be stronger than the older brother. Right there in the scriptures. This is why we outdo them. But in that particular scripture, there's one thing that I want to bring to your attention. They said, we require of you a song. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. So now I am going to play a song. And you probably never knew what this song ever meant. So I'm going to play this song. And then we're going to pick up after it. Now, I want you to do this. Listen closely to the lyrics of this song. I know you've heard it before. But listen to every lyric that they say, all right? Here we go. Swing low, sweet coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet to carry me home I look 
walked over Jordan And what did I see Coming for to carry me home I saw a band of angels coming after me coming for to carry me That's why I sing, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me. You never knew what that song meant, did you? I bet you it's crystal clear now. Swing low, sweet chariot coming forth to carry me home. The slaves knew the scriptures. The slaves knew who they were. A lot of y'all don't even know what that was. Those were prayers to the Most High for us. The slaves left that song behind. Our ancestors left that song behind for us to keep our hopes up, to remember the promise that the Most High God said that he gave the covenant to our ancestors all the way down to our descendants. What's going to happen in the future? The future that Christ and the angels are coming back from the heavens in chariots to come get the Israelites and take us home to Jerusalem coming forth to carry me home our home is Jerusalem and when they finish taking us home they are going to destroy this planet with fire because of what they did to us the slaves were praying for this to happen that's how much they loved us that is how much our Ancestors love us, everything that they went through, everything that they endured, and they were still praying for us to be hopeful. Our ancestors, our ancestors, scattered all over the place. That song is world-renowned. The Southern Kingdom was saying it, which were the Blacks, the West Indians, and the Haitians, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, and the others were singing it as well the Northern Kingdom, the Latinos and the Native Americans because we were scattered all over this planet in slavery. And those were prayers going right up to the Most High God for us because the Most High God promised that, the, that Christ and the angels were coming back in the chariots to take us home. They were praying and saying, please come and get us. Come get us. Take us out of here. The slaves knew the scriptures. So for any person sitting there talking about the slaves didn't know nothing about the Bible, you are a damn liar. You are an absolute liar. Those were our ancestors. I saw a band of angels as far as I can see. That's the angels that's coming back. The whole army, the troops of the angels that the Most High God said he is sending to this earth to come get the one third out and take us back to Jerusalem where we belong, our home. Coming forth to carry me home. 
It's right there for you, Israel. And this is why, again, I keep reiterating this. This judge had the absolute nerve to go and give that Edomite woman our book, our holy sacred book that belongs to us. To go embrace her oppressor that killed her little brother. Ridiculous. But Israel, I think I've taken up enough of your time. You know who you are. You know who you belong to. You know every time now that you look at your brother and your sister, you better see a king, queen, prince, and princess. And not only that, you see a God in our people. We better stop treating each other like garbage and stop treating each other like trash. The killings need to stop. The insults need to stop. The hate on our people need to stop. We have to start keeping the law, statutes, and commandments so that, guess what? The songs that they required of us can become true and that prophecy can be fulfilled and we can go home. And with that being said, Israel, I love y'all. I'm out.